So I wanted to make one comment. Um, uh, Cable Green had asked the question about the Common Core um, state standards, and I wanted to mention to all of you here from the 70, uh, 24 institutions that Oregon did receive two grants related to the Common Core. Um, the one grant um, w was done by the Oregon University System, and I'm not very familiar. I think it focuses more on the schools of education perspective and the Common Core. And the second grant really looks at students transitioning from high school into college. And what does that look like? Do they have to repeat courses, or do we have alignment of the standards? And Lisa over here, if you want to stand up, is actually a director for the Core to College grant. And a faculty from the University of Oregon, Dev Sinha, who is a lead person in the Common Core, is also part of the degree qualifications profile core team. So when Gaston had uh, indicated that there is going to be work related to conversations with the degree qualifications profile and the Common Core, I think Oregon is poised yet again to engage in that conversation and also lead that conversation nationally. So I wanted to point that out. I want to remind you again that you do have a blue form, which is the evaluation. So start filling that out. Some of you will not be back tomorrow. So make sure you finish the evaluation for those items for um, on, on uh, today's agenda. So with that, if the plenary panelists could please come up, I turn it over to our director, Ron Baker, who is going to moderate the session. I feel like I had a breakout in song or something. Rarely do I have a captive audience anymore. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here um, after that nice lunch. Is my mic not on? Oops, I gotta, I gotta unmute it. That one's on me. Okay, how's that? That's better? Well, you missed my opening joke. <laughs> it is a great pleasure to be here. I would like to start off, if I may, uh, by just taking uh, moderator's privilege for just a second. You know, we've heard this morning about many of the challenges facing higher education. Uh, especially accreditation, and I want to say, and, and this is absolutely from a disinterested third-party perspective, that I'm, I'm amazed and I'm, I'm actually quite uh, comforted by the fact that through the new standards and accreditation process that the Northwest is just incredibly well positioned to be able to respond to these. Well, there was the opening joke. <laughs> um, I would like to, uh, to introduce the speakers, our panelists this morning, and I'd like to do so by, uh, by impressing you with their incredible qualifications for being on this panel, but this is neither the time nor the place to do that. But let me introduce everybody up here. First that's going to speak is Mark Williams, the Dean of Career and Technical Education at Umpqua Community College. Sarah Witt, Associate Vice, Pres Vice President for Academic Affairs at Eastern Oregon University. Larry Shane, who's an Education Specialist with the Oregon Department of Community College and Workforce Development. And then finally, Karen Moranjel, who's Assistant Vice Chancellor for Academic Standards and Collaboration for the Oregon uh, University System. Repeating what you've heard this morning, uh, the the purpose of the DQP, or at least one of the purposes of the DQP, is to try to articulate or pr provide some sense of the essential meta outcomes that characterize our degrees. Uh, in essence, uh, getting beyond the rhetoric to down to some meaning, something more than just simply you're an educated person and a bachelor's a higher level of learning than an associate degree. So what are the essential meta outcomes? that characterize our degrees. What characterizes an AA? What characterizes a BA? What's the difference between a BA and a BS degree? Other than, well, one includes a little more science than the other. Can we come up with something a little bit more depth? And again, I'm using the word characterization uh, very consciously. 
It's not a narrow definition, and you've heard that this morning. It's not to try and restrict anybody, but can we at least give the essence of that degree? The question that we're going to uh, pose this morning is we're going to look at uh, why engage in this process? It all sounds like it's a great idea. Somebody ought to do it. Uh, we'd like to encourage those who are doing it, but why us? And so we're going to start off with an institutional perspective on the challenges and the benefits of having these kinds of really difficult conversations because we're really getting down beyond just the mechanics of how we go about it or the overarching rhetoric that we use to describe it. But now we're really engaging in those deeper conversations. Why would an institution want to undertake this? And why is it beneficial or are there challenges to try and do it on a more collective basis? And so with that, I'll turn it over to Mark to give the first institutional perspective. Well, for me, um, I think John has already given the best testimony to this. Uh, the conversations that we've had, just because we took it and ran with it, the conversations that it triggered with faculty, and especially the conversations that were triggered, be triggered between faculty and students. Um, I think I could stop there, but let me go on. Um, I, I don't know about you, but at our school, there's a certain amount of pushback from faculty, like, haven't we done this before? There was a, a comment earlier this morning that was along those lines. We've talked about course outcomes. We've defined them. What happened to them? And um, we can't always give a good answer for that. And uh, one area of interest that we've had from faculty is that this could be the answer. Here we finally have a system that really captures our course outcomes, it captures our program outcomes, and has a meaningful way of relating them. So I think that's a very powerful argument to take back to your, um, to your campus. Um, at Umpqua Community College yesterday, we finished with our accreditation visit. Yes. So today feels like a vacation. It is. Um, it was a very powerful thing to bring to the accreditation visit. You know, we had a chance to talk about our work. So I want to take just a second and show the tool. Um, this is a little teaser. We're going to be talking about how you can engage with the tool at the afternoon sessions. And I also want to brag on Kyle. Kyle, are you here? The, uh, the man who looked like a mountaineer who's in the green shirt over there, incredible work at, um, at taking this and putting it onto a web application. So if you go to the website, you have the URL. It's definitely available from the Lane website. Everybody's listed. Not everybody has anything yet, but we go to Umqua Community College, and we have John's program. So you click there. Here's a listing of the programs. You click on the program, and you get a mapping. So at the top, you have the program outcomes, just very briefly. And at the bottom, you have all the courses. Now, this is a cool thing that Kyle added uh, very nicely. The shape or the profile of the program is listed to the right. If you click on any one of the program outcomes, well, that one's pretty similar. I'll pick a different one. The shape of the individual program outcome is then mapped on top of the overall program outcome, so you can compare and contrast. Similarly, you can do that with courses. So if you want to see what BA 221 adds, there it is. So, you know, yes, it's a system for capturing this. It would be actually not that significant. Okay, it's a nice way of capturing it, but what really is cool is the conversations that are triggered. You take two or three or more faculty in a room and have them look at this picture, and I can guarantee you there's a conversation that will come from it. A good one. So 
So um, I guess I'll just zip forward to one final point. The key is in the way it engages students. We started to get there, I think, at the end of the morning session, really talking about how the visibility, the transparency, the cable greenness of it, um, it impacts students and their conversation with them, the counseling and advising, and the questions that they get to come back and ask their instructors. You didn't teach us this. Oh, yes, I did. No, you didn't. You know, Those are good conversations. Um, so I think there's a lot of good pragmatic reasons to engage with the DQP, um, and maybe those, you know, accreditation, the system side, whatever, um, I think of as the spoonful of medicine that helps the sugar go down. But I also think there's an intrinsic quality to working, uh, to doing this with students. And this kind of ties to some of what Cable talks about in terms of thinking differently, whether it's crowdsourcing or whether it's using the social networking tools to get our job done. Somehow, the students have to become part of the engine, not part of the caboose. So we have to be getting energy from the students, the more of them there are. If we're going to ramp up to 60% by 2025, or if we're going to do 40-40-20, it's only going to be done if the students become part of the energy. And that only happens if we have this open, transparent system. Stop there. Thank you. that. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, when Ron asked Mark and I to consider why the DQP matters from an institutional vantage point, I had two thoughts. One of the thoughts was um, formal and historical, and the other was personal and spatial. So I'll start with the formal and historical. And it's very like uh, Peggy Mackey's comment that higher education has enduring values that span the centuries. And it's never a bad thing to be asked to convene and reaffirm those values. I think that's what the DQP allows us to do as an academy. It's also consequential that all of our missions embed these values. We express it differently, various community colleges, 17 in Oregon. We have seven Oregon University uh, universities, OUU. Um, we may express it differently, but those values, those learning outcomes, those essential learning outcomes are embedded in it. And our degrees express those values. Uh, so, so that's sort of the historical perspective. Um, within our institution, our mission, like your missions, drive uh, what we're trying to make accessible to our students. And our students come to us from various pathways. Some of them come to us in accelerated uh, dual credit programs at the high school. Some come to us through community colleges. Some uh, come to us and intend to transfer to another Oregon university. Uh, and some come to those Oregon universities and transfer to us uh, for a variety of reasons. And the DQP matters because the students need to know where they are uh, in terms of their learning, uh, regardless of the transfer. So now I want to move to uh, the personal and spatial. And I'll be invoking the firmament that uh, George invoked earlier. Uh, when I moved to Oregon, and I'll start with a personal story. When I moved to Oregon, uh, I came from a rural state, but I didn't live on a farm. Uh, so I was considered a good fit for Eastern Oregon University because it's a rurally situated university. Uh, what I hadn't counted on is how far it was from an airport, for example. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had a friend who graciously uh, informed me, he was living in South Carolina at the time, that uh, surely I planned to buy a vehicle and 
well, I hadn't planned on it because I was a poor graduate student and, you know, was uh, depending on my brother to help me move out to Oregon. So he bothered to drive a 70, 72 Buick Electra to Iowa City, uh, sold it to me for a dollar, and I used that to drive all the way to uh, La Grande, Oregon. When I got there, uh, my brother sent me, he's a collector of postcards, he sent me uh, a postcard you'll all recognize as either a poster or a postcard or a t-shirt, and it, it was a picture of the galaxy, and it had a line that said, you are here. And instead of posting my office hours in the slot provided on my door, I posted that postcard and chuckled every time I opened my office door because I was having trouble initially knowing where I was because I couldn't see the horizon line. There were suddenly mountains, and uh, I needed to know where I was. Uh, I left it there the, for the 14 years I occupied that office because students kept commenting on it. it, it you know, you go to the mall and you are here, um, but it was funny uh, from the remote rural situation I was in that you are here and here is my office and we're going to have a conversation about uh, how you're progressing in your major. But it, it and, and I invoke that story because that postcard had so much meaning for me that I saved it, of course, when I moved out of my office. And it's among the mementos of my life as, you know, this is about that experience. And I think that many students come to our university feeling like they need to know where they are and the DQP f provides that sense of where they are in their learning. They might start as freshmen, and you can say, you're here, you know, and we need to get there, and we're gonna do uh, all of this scaffolded stuff to get you there, uh, and, and I think the DQP provides a model where they can visually see where they are um, in the university and in the universe. And, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I think I'll end there. Okay, I'm going to stay seated. Does this work? If that's okay. Karen and I were, were watching Mark and Sarah go to the podium, or the lectern, excuse me, and kind of wondering, oh no, are we going to have to do the same thing? I don't want to look like... I don't want to look like Joe Buck before the <laughs> World Series last night. I don't know if anybody saw that, but that was an odd sight. Guy at a lectern on third base, on the third base line, <laughs> on a big round thing, looked like a hovercraft, like he was going to take off and fly around the field. <laughs> anyway, uh, so from the statewide perspective, and, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll primarily, obviously, be talking about um, the community college, but um, a lot of the work that I've been involved with has also. Uh, engaged with that vertical alignment. And I know we're not necessarily going to go to the vertical part um, this fall. That's, that's going to be more next spring. But there are a number of initiatives and, and things that we have in place that I think um, the DQP may help us address a bit of the unfinished business that we have to address. And, and uh, I'll just kind of go down the list. Um, and I think those of you, many of you in this room, have been involved in those things. Um, it'll resonate with you. Accelerated college credit and, and early college. You know, in the dual credit arena, um, frankly, uh, it's been based largely on instructor qualification, and I think we all recognize that. I think the DQP gives us an opportunity to look at it from the standpoint of outcomes. Now, and we, you know, it's already come up, the Common Core State Standards and, and those coming online and, and that work with Core to College and, and the work that um, Sonia had pointed out that Lisa is leading. Uh, you know, we've heard from some of our secondary partners and also some of the community colleges, what does that mean for us when it comes to articulating credit? That high schools are going to be doing something perhaps quite different in terms of um, the expectations for students and how, how that is assessed. 
and how are we still going to be able to articulate? I think the DQP opens up that conversation for us to be able to look at it from the standpoint of, well, what do we really expect a student to be able to know and do? And we all know it's not necessarily age or grade specific. And we're going to see a blurring of those lines um, more so than, than we ever have before in terms of where we are going with education reform in Oregon. Um, you'll hear about the grades 11 to 14 kind of pocket within the pre-K to 20 continuum. And, and I think the DQP uh, allows us or sets up a framework for us to, to open up some of those conversations. Also, in terms of um, transfer degrees, such as the AAOT, which has been talked about, and, and we have the ASOT, the Associate of Science Oregon Transfer in Business as well. And for a number of years, um, the Joint Board's Articulation Commission has talked about, well, what about other types of transfer degrees, statewide transfer degrees, Associate of Science in something else? And we've never really moved beyond kind of the, well, well what if? And I think the, the DQP gives us, uh, again, a framework from which to start having some of those conversations more deeply and more specific in certain areas um, as we look at what students would be doing. And then I think it, um, in the career and technical education arena and the statewide degrees that we have for Associate of Applied Science, um, quite honestly, and, and those of you involved with these, um, will recognize some of those are very strong in both their horizontal alignment amongst the institutions that are that are um, participating and offering those degrees and their vertical alignment and the I mean a great example is with the Oregon Consortium for Nurse Educate Nursing Education um, you know there's some there's some go really good alignment across those member colleges uh, both uh, for the community colleges and to Oregon Health and Sciences University. Um, the emergency um, medical is another good example, and Johnny Mack there in the, in the back can, can speak to this. Um, but we also have some statewide degrees that, you know, quite frankly, we haven't really managed them much at all. Actually, not at all. And, and they've kind of just they kind of are just there, you know, so I'm just laying it out there. And I think that the, the DQP gives us an opportunity, again, for a framework to initiate some of those conversations. Thanks. Thanks, Larry. Don't clap. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to pick up on what Larry was just um, finishing up with, and, and I think Cable gave us a good, a good way to, to think about this project this morning when he challenged us to use the DQP to think strategically. Um, and I think that's important, and, and that's, that's helping me frame this work at the system-wide level. And I think that this will be very helpful for you to frame this work at your institutional level. Um, I want to talk about students. Um, students are really at the center of all the work that we engage with at the institutions and certainly at the system. And Paul mentioned this morning the videos of Harvard grads, um, kind of just in a, in a slide, unpassing. And I don't know if you've seen these videos, but if you haven't, I encourage you to take a look at them. So just to recap, these were videos that were taken, these are what, 10, 15, 20 years old now, of Harvard students on graduation day, and they were asked questions like, what causes the seasons? The example that Paul showed was, why is it colder in the winter? And time and time again in the videos, you see Harvard students on graduation day unable to answer these questions that seem pretty basic. My vision is that I could go around to any of the graduation ceremonies at any of the Oregon universities on graduation day and ask our students those questions and they'd be able to answer them. They'd be able to say, this is what I know. Here's my demonstration of it. And I know that our faculty in our institutions also want that to happen. But we have a lot of work to do before we get there. So I want to make four points about why the DQP work is important to the Oregon University system. First, it raises the question about who is responsible for students. And let me give an example from my own teaching. I'm a mathematics professor. My research area is the research of undergraduate learning and teaching. Um, I taught differential equations um, for a number of years, and in that class, my students were um, encur not encouraged, they were expected to collaborate in teams and communicate. And that was, that was really important to me as, an, as a mathematics professor, and it was important to our department. But I was 
very focused on my students when they were in my class and not really all that focused on them once they left my class. So when they went on to the next professor's class, if they received further instruction in teamwork or if they were expected to communicate, I didn't really know. And maybe that, that was a fault of our department, but there was no taking responsibility of the student from the department level. So we may say in the department, oh, we value students working in teams and we prepare our students to work in teams. But you know and I know that there are ways that students can navigate their way through taking courses where they never have to work in teams or they never are challenged to communicate um, and they're never assessed on communication. So I think that this project raises that question at the institution, department, and faculty level about who's taking responsibility for our students. Next, the next point I want to make is that the work is important to us in Oregon, and it clearly builds on the efforts that are already underway here. Our institutions, community colleges, universities have done incredible work outlining um, student learning outcomes, getting together, talking about the alignment of those student learning outcomes, and we're ready. We're chomping at the bit for the next step in this, which to me, I see that next step as engaging in assessment. That's the only way that we can go back and think about are those learning outcomes effective? Are they doing what they're supposed to do? Stu uh, Susan mentioned this morning, this is an incredible opportunity to address the specialization within the AAOT. And as Larry just mentioned, thinking about other specialization transfer degrees, we're ready to do that. Um, there's a lot of research out there on learning goals, and it's, it's clear that when teachers at the classroom level are clear about their learning goals in their classroom, students learn more and they learn better. Why would we not think that that doesn't apply to us at the universities and to our programs? If we're clear about our learning goals in our programs, our students are gonna be more effective graduates. The third point is, um, is, is really uh, just an underscore of many of the points that we heard this morning. This work is timely as we wrestle with things like prior learning, um, the value of college education in today's society, and we know that it's not enough anymore just to say, I know my students are learning this. We, for a variety of reasons, need to show how and, and why they're learning. And finally, assessment. So I alluded to this um, just a minute ago. We're at the point in this state to really tackle assessment, to really think about how we're assessing in our programs, what that means as we look across institutions, what's, what it means for our students as they move to and through various institutions. The, um, the, the learning that's going on out there in MOOCs, they are way ahead of us on assessment. They're taking big data and they're feeding it back into their courses for real-time adjustments that they can document. We're very far behind where they're at, and they've been at, at this in, in a much shorter period of time than we have. So we need to take assessment seriously, not only for our students, but for the great work that we're doing in our institutions. Um, do we need the DQP to do this? No, we don't. We don't need the DQP to do this. But I'll tell you why the DQP is going to matter. So, I might be a student who's lucky enough to be in the chemistry program at the University of Oregon where that department engages um, very seriously with tracks of programs for different students. I might be lucky enough to go through that program where I know if I'm a graduate going into pre-med or if I'm a graduate going into graduate school, the faculty there have thought very carefully in that department about what my learning should be. Or I might be a student lucky enough to be in Mark Yanata's class at Chemeketa Community College where he's worked hard to create an introduction to proof course so that as a math, as a future math major at Portland State, when I transfer to Portland State, I know what to expect in my math classes there and I, I, I already know some of the faculty there because of the close interaction. So if I'm, and those are, I'm just picking on those two programs because I know something about them. I know there's plenty of, of great, great pockets of work going on in the state. But my point is that those are pockets of work. I don't wanna have to roll the dice and be a lucky student who ends up in a program like that where there's been careful thought happening. I, I, I wanna make sure that this is available for every student in every program in this state. And that's why we need to engage with something like the DQP because we need to ensure that this is available for all students no matter if they're a chemistry major or a business major, whether they're going to school at Southern Oregon or Oregon State, wherever they're at, they're going to have a quality educational experience. 
And finally, I'll just end with this work is, is clearly connected in many of the ways that Larry had outlined to the work that's going on at the university system in terms of our learning outcomes and assessment work group who's been working on outcomes for quite some time. We're also engaged in partnership with the community colleges around work in the common core state standards and there are very clear connections with that work. Um, we're also working with aligning um, high school advanced learning opportunities um, to, to university um, entrants and then all of the work that we do with, with transfer. So is the DQP necessary to do this? Um, I think it is. Thank you very much um, to our panelists. We're gonna take some questions, but I wanna take one off of the back channel because it's, <laughs> even though it's directed at Karen, I think it raises a bigger issue. What you've heard at this point is it's all good. Nary a, a discouraging word is heard about engaging in the DQP. So what's the holdup? What's the hang up? Well, the, the question that's asked of Karen is, um, is the witchy passport the same thing as the DQP? The bigger question, and I'd ask the panelists to address this, and then we'll take more questions from the audience, <clears throat> is um, the, the challenge of uh, uh, repetition. This is just a repackaging of the same old thing. Uh, and initiative fatigue. Um, it's a good thing to do, but uh, if, if sometimes too much of a good thing is just that, too much. Uh, is this become too much, or are there synergies that are created that say, but this is helping to move it in the direction that we're doing with other things. And so other work that's being done might leverage the work that's being done in DQP. And similarly, the work being done in DQP can leverage some of those other things which have already been established as being important. So, so I'm just kind of asking the question generally. We'll start with Karen first to answer the specific question about uh, the witchy uh, passport. But what about this notion either on your own campus or statewide about, well, what are some of the challenges with doing that, doing one more good thing? Um, so let me go general and then I'll go specific. I think all of this work is, is, is really under the big umbrella of improving student learning. That's what we're doing, and assessment's part of that. So yeah, we have different, the way that I see it is we have different, in, different initiatives going on. So basically different ways that we're getting money to come into the state to fund this work to improve student learning, but it's all about student learning. So everything we do is about student learning, um, whether it's through the DQP or another effort on your campus or through Witchy or something else. Um, so I see it as all connected, um, and there may be, you may be involved in different parts of different projects, but we're all working towards the same goal. Um, so to this specific question about the Witchy Passport, Witchy has helped in the, in, so uh, Witchy, the Witchy Passport, Oregon is part of a, of a pilot project um, that's being directed by Witchy. And there are four institutions in Oregon who are piloting that work, University of Oregon and Lane, and Eastern Oregon and Columbia Gorge Community College. Um, and we're digging in in that project to three areas, written communication, oral communication, and quantitative literacy. And I think for the institutions that are involved, it's helped, it's helped to lay some groundwork for the DQP work. Um, but it's all about student learning. So the idea is to help facilitate student transfer among four partner states, so interstate student transfer. And this is significant because we have over 13,000 students who transfer in and out of Oregon each year. So while in state we have things like the AAOT and the OTM, um, what about those 13,000 students who are going to California or Utah or coming here from Hawaii or North Dakota? We want to make sure that they're having smooth transfer as well. So. Uh, yes, this is the same thing because it's all under the umbrella of student learning and assessing student learning. Variation on a theme. Okay. I, I would agree with Karen on that. I, I think, you know, and again, this is going to be sound a little bit selfish on my part, but um, the, you know, there's unfinished business with the AOT and OTM. Um, you know, it's not a general education core. It's, it's agreed upon set of outcomes and and then institutions, uh, you know, have a list of courses by which a student could get there, so to speak. But, um, you know, it's, it's not, it, I mean, I think the information literacy piece, for instance, I'll just put it out there. I, I think there are a lot of people who are still kind of uncomfortable with how that ended up in the AOT. So I think the DQP allows us 
not an add-on thing, but it, 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 it's going to give us an opportunity to kind of distill down to some of the essence of what we really want to get at with students um, to move forward and, and make the AAOT stronger or whatever the next iteration is. Um, but I mean, I don't know if I'm on the right track with that or not, but as someone who works a lot with the AAOT and gets questions quite often from, from institutions about you know, what does this really mean? Are students really able to use it in transfer? Um, why does it sometimes still seem to get unpacked when there's transfer? You know, all those types of questions. I, I think DQP gives us a real opportunity here. I would say that just as uh, the LEAP essential learning outcomes helped us focus for a duration of time on general education or a liberal education, the DQP enables us a space of time to focus in on the degree profile um, that y both embeds and um, uses liberal education as uh, a foundation. So I think that it's not substantially something different, but it allows us, as uh, Larry was suggesting, another opportunity to dig deeper, um, to have uh, the opportunity to uncover some of the challenges that uh, have come from previous initiatives, which is professional development, for example. That as degree program faculty discuss what they mean by uh, writing and written communication, and that's the teaser for breakout session number three, um, <laughs> while faculty discuss that, they start getting at um, the those criteria that characterize that learning outcome. And personally, uh, at our university, we've got a lot of these frameworks in place that actually now enables us to have those conversations so that we're not talking about frameworks anymore, we're actually talking about substance. And uh, what does written communication mean in your discipline? And how is it the same? And what do we share with other disciplines? And what is in addition to that? And our session will um, introduce you to a process that we're going to pilot um, that, that enables faculty to have that conversation without being off put by the A word. Um, but that's essentially what we're having a conversation about. What do you value? You know, what do you value in your discipline? And um, is it uh, expressed the way you wanted it to be expressed? And can you express it um, to another colleague at another university who either shares your discipline or not? Um, do we value some of the same criteria? And can we say something about that and how our students are doing relative to that? Uh, those criteria and those learning outcomes. So that's what I think the value, it's both a hurdle and, and a value f of the DQP. It's, as Karen suggested, very timely um, because I think we are ready to have uh, those conversations and turn it over to the faculty in, whom, in whose hands, as George pointed out, um, we, we entrust this conversation. Uh, you are the experts in the room and uh, the university depends on you to have those conversations in a substantive way that maintains the integrity of what it is the academy values. For me, the key feature is that it's not prescriptive, um, that it's not preemptive, that it's descriptive. And in many disciplines, you'll have the conversation about the shift in understanding that comes when you have the right descriptive framework, the right language, the right symbolism. Um, and that's what the DQP does, um, I think, from my perspective, is it gives us that general framework. It's not there yet. It has to include assessment. I think there are ways that we've seen uh, that it needs to be extended and expanded but uh, the fact that it does give us that general language for what we're doing, I think, is key. We have a little bit of time left for some uh, questions and answers. Let me see a show of hands. There will be a pop quiz afterwards, so now's your chance. We have a question over here from Columbia Gorge. 
I was wondering if, um, when I think about the, the decision to do the horizontal first rather than the vertical, I had a little concern and I was just wondering how you're dealing with this. It seems to me when I'm thinking about outcomes, I want to know where I'm going ultimately and to, to be able to, to set up that kind of hierarchy, that direction. So if I'm at a community college and I want to make an outcome for where my students are going to be at the end when they leave and they're going to transfer up, I need to know where they need to be to transfer up. So that I'm just concerned, or, or what the, how the decision was made to look at the horizontal first rather than the vertical. Well, well let me jump in on that. I, I don't know that it's set up to be linear. I think the way that institutions are invited to participate is that through the, uh, the institutional engagement, having those conversations internally, whether you're also interested or rather interested in having the communication amongst peer institutions, peer granting, degree granting institutions, or whether you want to focus on the vertical integration. So I, I don't know that one has to start with the, with the uh, institutional engagement. That's going to be there whichever other path that you take because you're starting to talk about it internally. But I don't know that you have to go through one to get the other. If your particular interest is, we'd really like to look at how well our degree integrates with a four-year institution, the project allows you an opportunity to do that. Um, I would say a couple things. One. John and I talked about the DQP. Our next reaction was, so let's go make a spreadsheet. Let's go do it. And for me, in some ways, the horizontal is low-hanging fruit. It's, it's easier. It's more immediate. I don't actually get the vertical integration. Um, the fact that it isn't clear to me that it's linearly scalable. Uh, some of the questions that Sarah was raising about which verbs belong in which place, it's a part of the model I don't, I don't fully understand, but I can embrace the horizontal part while we work on the vertical. Well, and I'll, I'll jump in here because I think in metaphors, what I see the vertical integration being is sort of like going to, trying to improve the synchromesh transmission on our car so we smoothly go between one gear and the next gear as opposed to doing a double clutch like we used to do in the past. Get out of this one, get suspended for a while, figure out where the next gear is, and then push it into that gear to try and streamline that to line it up both to enhance student access student progression, student ascension from one degree to the other, as well as all of the other benefits that have been explained as well. Feedback to the students, clarity on the part of the educational community, the faculty, the staff, et cetera, on where we're going. But I see that as how can we sort of tighten this up and line it up to make sure that we're not putting in, uh, inadvertently putting uh, hindrances or barriers in the student in going from one level to another level that they continue on a path as opposed to reaching a point, a plateau, and then having a hesitation or a bump and going to the next one. Another question? Over here. Thanks, I'm gonna stand because it makes me twice as tall as I am when I sit. <laughs> um, so this, this is more of a, of a comment and it's just something that's whirling in my mind listening to all of this. As we look at the outline in the pamphlet of the DQP and I, and I agree there's danger in glossy print, um, it's in levels. And we're all pretty used to levels. Most of us worked our way up through some kind of tiered educational process. But listening to Cable Green, it occurs to me that just different schools do different things. And they do it with different content. You know, if I want to go be a, a nurse, I need to go to a nursing school. And it really doesn't matter if it's an AA program or a bachelor's program in many ways. So I'm just wondering what, what it would mean if we said these really aren't tiered. We're just emphasizing different points in a learning journey to get you to some place that you ultimately want to go but may not be able to describe clearly at the beginning. So as you move along, and if that would kind of really make us focus on the outcomes rather than tag them as these are now master's level outcomes and therefore different from AA level outcomes. I think the thinking gets broader the number of uh, situations you can think about expand as you go up in learning, but the basic skills of knowledge and what it means to know something don't actually change that deeply. So I'm, I've just 
I'm sitting with that thought as, as I listen to all this. And it's kind of an exciting thought to me. Well, thank you. We're, we're at the end of our, of our session right now. I would like to wrap up uh, by paraphrasing something. It takes, an, it takes a community to educate a student. It takes a, it takes a community to award a degree. And I think what we've tried to do today through at this level of conversation, you're going to get into the heavy lifting later on this afternoon, more of the details. But at this point in time, what the panelists were trying to do was to provoke some thought and promote some dialogue to get us started on this. What, what are we talking about? What does it mean? Uh, what, is the, what is the substance of this? And how does, it, how does it affect us? And so if we've accomplished that, uh, both now and through the rest of the conference, and more importantly, when you go back to campus. I think all of us that have been involved in putting this conference together are going to be grossly disappointed if your own curiosity uh, stops uh, at 3.30 tomorrow when the conference is over. The whole idea is, is that you continue to gather, you inform your own thinking, you start to solidify things, and you, you take that back to campus to expand the conversation with the colleagues back there on the meaning of their degrees and how do our degrees relate to our peers. Do we, are we talking about the same thing? And for a student who wants to go on to a deeper level of learning, are we helping them to do that? Are they getting there because of us or in spite of us? And to some degree in the past, it may have been more in spite of than because of, than, than because of the work that we're doing. None of this says that you take any of the flavor out of your institution or your degree. You can flavor it, your educational philosophy and all of that. But if we're talking about a BA, we should all at least be saying we're talking about the same kind of thing, even though the way we interpret it may be just a little bit different. But going to this school or this school doesn't mean that you're getting a substantially different degree if we're calling it by the same name. I'd appreciate it if you join me in thanking our panelists. You'll see more of them later in the program.